Hey there, ninth graders. Are you looking for a quick and easy way to revise all your chapters from moments? Well, you're in the right place. Give this video a listen and you'll be all prepared for your exams. Hello there, ninth graders, and welcome to your summary and a 10 minute session with me. Today, we're going over a chapter from moments, which is the lost child. So let's get right to it. The Lost Child is a story written by Mulk Raj Anand. In this story, a child visits a spring fair with his parents. The place was crowded with people and there were different kinds of stalls set up at the fair. The child was excited when he saw the toys in the shops and pleaded with his parents to buy him a toy. But his father gave him a stern look upon hearing his request. Meanwhile, his mother asked him to see the mustard field, which looked like a field of gold. A group of dragonflies were fluttering their colourful wings over the mustard flowers. The child tried catching one of those colourful insects, but as his mother called him, he ran towards his parents happily. He heard the cooing of doves and picked up some petals in the grove. But again, as his parents called him, he made his way towards them while he was running around the banyan tree. When the child reached the fair with his parents, he saw a sweetmeat seller calling out gulab jamun, rasgulla, barfi, jalebi. His mouth watered seeing the tasty sweets and he asked his father to buy him a sweet. But no one paid heed to his request. As he went ahead with his parents, he heard a flower seller selling a garland of gulmohar. He saw the basket of flowers and wanted to buy a garland. However, he knew his parents would not buy him the flowers, so he moved on with them. Then, he noticed a balloon man selling rainbow-coloured balloons. He wanted to buy those balloons, but he knew that his parents would refuse, considering he was comparatively older to play with those colourful balloons. Hence, he walked past the balloon man with his parents. As he moved forward, the child noticed a snake charmer who was playing the flute to a snake coiled in a basket. He went closer to the snake charmer, but he knew his parents wouldn't approve of his listening to such coarse music. So, he walked further and saw a merry-go-round. He observed that many people were enjoying this ride and called out to his parents that he wanted to take a ride too. But there was no reply from them. When he turned around, he couldn't find his parents nearby. The child desperately looked out for his parents, but they were nowhere to be found. He understood that he was lost, so he started sobbing. The child gave out a loud, deep cry and tears started rolling down his eyes as he searched for his parents everywhere. He cr cried loudly and ran to and fro, but he couldn't find his parents anywhere. The place was very crowded and he ran to the shrine if he could find them there. Unfortunately, he was lost and as he was little, he went ahead crossing many people and getting lost. Suddenly, a man heard his cry and lifted him up in his arms. The child was fortunate that he was picked up by an affectionate man. The kind man asked him about his parents, but the child replied sobbingly, not knowing their whereabouts. The man tried to make the child happy and asked him if he would like to take a ride on the merry-go-round. But the child replied that he only wanted to see his parents. Soon, the man took the child to the balloon man, the sweet shop and the flower seller and asked if he would like to buy any of those. But the young boy refused. He was adamant that he wanted nothing but his parents. The child turned his face away from all those things which he actually wanted to buy earlier. Thus, the child only shouted, I want my mother, I want my father. That brings us to the end of the summary. Today, we are going over the adventures of Toto from Moments, so let's get right to it. The Adventures of Toto is an amusing story written by Ruskin Bond. This story features the pranks of a naughty monkey named Toto. The narrator's grandfather was very fond of animals. One day, he bought a small baby monkey from a Tonga driver for a sum of five rupees. Grandfather had a collection of many animals in his private zoo, such as a tortoise, a tiny squirrel, a pair of rabbits and a pet goat. Toto was a new addition to the group. 
Toto was a cute little monkey with sparkling eyes and was very mischievous by nature. He had pearl white teeth and a long tail that served as his third hand. The narrator's grandmother was not so fond of animals, so grandfather decided to keep Toto in a secret place. He kept the baby monkey in the narrator's little closet in his bedroom and tied Toto to a peg fastened to the wall. Being a mischievous monkey, Toto created a nuisance from the very first day. He spoiled the ornamental wallpaper, damaged the peg and tore the narrator's blazer into pieces. Seeing all this mischief, Grandfather realized that Toto was a smart animal. Soon, Toto was transferred to a huge cage and kept with Grandfather's other animals who lived together amicably. But the monkey had a troublesome nature and created a nuisance for all the other pets. So, when Grandfather had to travel to Sharanpur to collect his pension, he secretly took Toto along with him. He packed the monkey in a big black canvas kit bag so that the animal could not come out of it. However, he jumped and rolled inside the bag and the floors of the Dehradun railway station. However, Toto peeped out of the bag and smiled at the ticket collector at the railway station, who charged Grandfather a fare of 3 rupees for carrying a dog. Grandfather argued that Toto was not a dog, but he still paid the fare. He had his pet tortoise along with him, for which the ticket collector didn't charge anything at all. Finally, Toto was accepted by Grandmother. Soon after that, Grandfather shifted him to a comfortable place in the stable along with his family donkey, Nana. But Toto would always tease Nana and they never became friends. Toto created a lot of nuisances wherever he went. He enjoyed taking hot water baths during winter. In one instance, he almost boiled himself alive when he jumped into a huge kitchen kettle that was kept on the fire for making tea. When Grandmother saw this, she quickly rescued and saved him from getting burnt. As days passed, Toto's mischief went on increasing when he tore clothes into pieces and broke utensils in the house. One day, Toto was having pulao from a large dish during lunchtime kept on the dining table. When Grandmother saw this, she screamed and another woman came forward. Toto splashed water on the face of that woman. When Grandmother came closer, Toto took the pulao plate and jumped into the branches of a jackfruit tree. After eating all the rice, he purposely threw the plate from the tree, breaking it into many pieces. Meanwhile, everyone in the family was very annoyed with Toto's mischievous tricks. It was becoming difficult to manage him as his menace increased by the day. So with a heavy heart, Grandfather decided to give away Toto to the Tonga driver and sold him for 3 rupees only. That brings us to the end of the summary. Today we are going over Ishwaran the storyteller from Moments, so let's get right to it. Ishwaran the storyteller is an interesting story written by R.K. Narayan about Mahendra, a bachelor and junior supervisor in a firm who stayed with his cook, Ishwaran. Mahendra had a tra transferable job, so he used to keep moving from one place to another very often as per the orders of his head office. However, Ishwaran would always accompany him wherever he went. He took great care of Mahendra and shared interesting stories with him. Ishwaran would buy fresh vegetables and cook delicious meals for Mahendra. While his master was away at work, Ishwaran would clean up the house, wash utensils and have a bath leisurely. He was very fond of reading popular Tamil thrillers during his free time. As a result, he often invented his own thrillers and would tell those stories to Mahendra when he returned from work. Mahendra too enjoyed listening to his cook stories as he would listen to every story or struck. Once, Ishwaran told him about a story of a wild elephant and how he controlled the menacing animal that had gone mad. He told Mahendra that he belonged to a place that was famous for timber, where he had seen logs of wood carried by elephants. These animals were fed a huge amount of food, but when they went wild, they went beyond the control of even the most experienced Mahout. One fine day, an elephant entered the school premises where children were playing and broke through the brick wall. 
all the children and teachers were terrified of the wild tusker and rushed to to a safe place to save themselves now when the wild tusker saw ishwaran it lifted its trunk and rushed towards him menacingly mustering up all of his force and courage ishwaran quickly whacked its third toenail and the elephant shivered head to foot and collapsed Mahendra was astounded at his cook's courage after listening to his story. On another occasion, Ishwaran had prepared a special meal for dinner on an auspicious day. He told Mahendra that he had prepared several delicacies to feed the spirits of their ancestors. Mahendra enjoyed the meal and complimented his cook on his culinary culinary skills. As usual, Ishwaran began with this storytelling but this time he talked about supernatural elements he said he was not afraid of ghosts and he was brave enough to deal with them ishwaran told his master that the place they stayed in was once a burial ground and he had also seen ghosts around him he particularly mentioned a gruesome ghost of a woman which appeared on and off at midnight during a full moon night Hearing this, Mahendra was scared and shivered at the description and rebuked Ishwaran stating that ghosts don't exist. Soon he retired to bed but could not sleep as the discussion about the ghost woman was hovering in his mind. From that day onwards Mahendra would go to sleep feeling uneasy thinking about the female ghost. One night as Mahendra was sleeping, he suddenly woke up from his sleep by a low moaning sound coming from his window. Out of curiosity he looked out of the window and saw the night sky was filled with moonlight and noticed a dark cloud shaped structure that was clutching a bundle seeing this mahendra started sweating profusely and fell on his pillow gasping the next morning Ish- ishwaran inquired his master about the female ghost and moaning sound that was coming from his room A chill ran down Mahendra's spine and he decided to leave the haunted place immediately and forever. That brings us to the end of the summary. Today we're going over in the kingdom of fools from moments, so let's get to it. In the Kingdom of Fools is a famous Kannada folktale adapted from AK Ramanujan's Folktales from India. This story is about a kingdom of fools that was ruled by a silly king and his foolish ministers. He along with his ministers ordered the people of the kingdom to consider night as day and day as night. They would sleep all day long and perform their daily tasks during the night. One fine day a guru and his disciple visited the kingdom and was surprised about the reverse rules set by the king and his ministers. They were astonished to find out that everything in the kingdom cost a single rupee only. The guru and his disciple were happy initially as they could buy anything by just spending a dud. However, the guru understood that it was not a wise decision to stay in a kingdom of fools. So, he left. His disciple was unwilling to leave the kingdom because of the ready availability of good food at a very reasonable rate. He was a big foodie and ate plenty of food and grew fat in a matter of few days. One day, a thief broke into the house of a rich merchant by making a huge hole in the wall and sneaking in. While he was returning with the stolen items, the wall of the house collapsed on his head, killing him instantly. However the thief's brother approached the king and complained to him that the house owner which is the merchant should be punished for not building a strong wall the king immediately summoned the merchant to his court when the merchant arrived he blamed the bricklayer for building a weak wall the bricklayer an old man was called to the king's court and pleaded with the king to punish the dancing girl for distracting his attention from work as she went to and fro that street all day wearing jingling anklets the dancing girl who had become old now blamed the goldsmith as he had delayed his work and made her walk up and down that street several times Soon the goldsmith was brought into the king's court who said that he was busy attending to a rich merchant's orders at that time due to some wedding rituals in his family. It was therefore ruled out that this merchant was the same house owner whose wall had collapsed on the burglar. The merchant pleaded that his father was the one who ordered the jewelry and he was dead already. 
but the king decided to punish the merchant for his father's deeds. A new stake was ordered to proceed with the execution. However, the merchant was extremely thin to fit the execution stake. So, the king ordered him to search for a fat man to fit the stake. The king's men searched the entire kingdom and found the disciple as an ideal fit for the stake. But as he was innocent, he pleaded with the king not to punish him for someone else's deeds. Since it was a kingdom of fools, no one listened to him. Waiting for his execution, the disciple then remembered his guru's words and requested him to help him. His guru, who was blessed with magical powers, could see his disciple's condition in his vision. At once, he arrived to save his disciple. He quietly whispered some words in his disciple's ears. Then, he requested the king to punish him instead of his disciple. However, when the disciple heard this, he requested the king to put the stake on him as he was brought there for execution first. Puzzled about who should die first, the king asked to resolve the conflict. And the guru cleverly told him that whoever would die on the stake first would be reborn as the future king of that kingdom. The one who died next would become the key minister of the kingdom. The king was baffled and did not want to lose his kingdom to someone else in the subsequent life. So he had a discussion with his minister and finally concluded that they should go on the stake to continue being the king and the minister in the next life. That night, they secretly went to the prison and set free the guru along with his disciple. The next morning, the king and his minister, who disguised themselves as the guru and his disciple, were executed at the stake. When the people of the kingdom saw that the king along with his minister was executed, they made the guru and his disciple their king and minister respectively. Although the Guru was hesitant initially, he finally gave in and reversed the rules of the kingdom and the people began leading a normal life like any other kingdom. Alright, that brings us to the end of the summary. Today we will be going over chapter 5 from Moments, which is the Happy Prince. So, what are we waiting for? Let's get right to it. So, The Happy Prince is a beautiful story written by Oscar Wilde. It is the tale of a sculpture of the Happy Prince that was covered with gold leaves and precious gems. The statue was placed at a height such that it overlooked the city from the top. One fine day, a swallow bird took shelter under the sculpture as he was flying to Egypt. He found that the happy prince was not happy indeed, but was rather miserable. So the bird asked the prince the reason for his unhappiness. The prince told him that when he was alive, he used to stay happy in his palace. He stayed uninformed of his people during his lifetime. But when he died, his statue was erected high on a tall column over the city. He became sad when he started noticing the misery and sufferings of the needy people of the city. And while his sculpture was covered with gold and many precious jewels, he could not help those in need since he couldn't move. So when the birds saw the prince's eyes filled with tears upon seeing the misery of the people, he decided to become the messenger of the prince to make him happy again. At first, the prince asked the swallow to take the ruby from his sword and give it to the needy seamstress or a woman who sews dresses who had no money to take care of her ailing son. On another occasion, the prince asked the bird to take out one sapphire from his eye and offer it to the poor dramatist who could not afford to make fire during winter to proceed with his composition. The bird followed the prince's instructions. One day, the prince noticed a match girl who was ruthlessly or badly beaten by her father for allowing her matches to fall in the canal. The prince's heart was filled with pain and he promptly asked the swallow to pluck out his other eye and help the young lady. However, the swallow was unwilling to do so as this would make the prince 
totally blind or visually impaired. But the prince insisted. Thereafter, the compassionate bird chose not to leave the prince, who was completely blind at this point. The bird would fly around the city and tell the prince about everything that he saw. Upon the instructions of the prince, the swallow removed the fine gold leaves from his body and offered it to the poor people. They did this until the happy prince looked very dull and somber. Soon, winter came and there was snow everywhere and the bird became colder and colder. Despite being weary and cold, he didn't leave the prince. Eventually, he became frail and died from exhaustion. Just then, there was a sudden curious crack that came from inside the sculpture, as though something had broken. It was indeed the lead heart of the prince that had snapped directly in two pieces at the sudden demise of the sweet and kind swallow. When the mayor and the town councillors saw the dull statue of the prince, they pulled it down. Soon after, they melted the sculpture in a furnace, yet the broken heart didn't melt. Thus, it was rendered useless for them, so they discarded it where the dead swallow was lying. Soon, God requested one of his angels to bring the two most valuable things in the city. And guess what? The angel brought the lead heart of the prince and the dead swallow. God warmly welcomed two beings in his garden of paradise and regarded them as his most charming creations. That brings us to the end of this wonderful story. Today we will be going over chapter 7 from Moments, which is The Last Leaf. A very beautiful story, so let's get right to it. The Last Leaf is a short story written by O. Henry. The story begins with John C. and Sue, who were young artists and friends living together in a small flat. Once, John C. fell seriously ill in the month of November. The doctor diagnosed that she was suffering from pneumonia. Her friend Sue was really worried and tried to cheer her up so that she would recover soon. But Johnsy had given up the hope of survival. She had somehow made up her mind that she would never recover and would die soon. Seeing her condition deteriorate or get worse, the doctor asked Sue to relieve Johnsy from all worries. Otherwise, her medicines wouldn't respond to her illness. So if John C. didn't believe that she could get better, the medicines would be of no use. Sue tried her best to cheer up John C. But John C. took no interest in the surroundings. She was non-responsive to any of Sue's efforts. One day, while John C. was lying on her bed, she noticed an ivy plant through the window that was gradually losing all of its leaves. Seeing the bare condition of the tree, Johnsy said that she would die the day the last leaf would fall off the plant. Although the ivy plant had nothing to do with her illness, Johnsy was depressed and could not think positively about her own recovery. Meanwhile, Sue continued convincing John C. that she would recover from her illness soon and she should not pin her journey of survival or recovery on the last leave of an ivy plant. Now, as days passed, John C. kept counting the remaining leaves of the plant every day. Unable to bear the pain of her dear friend, Sue approached Berman an aged scientist who lived downstairs and explained about Johnsy's mental state. She told him how a friend had pinned her survival on the last leaf of the ivy plant. Soon, Berman came to visit Johnsy but found her asleep. Sue pulled the curtains of the window of her room and they went to sit in the other room. That day, it was raining heavily along with a storm 
and she felt the leaves of the ivy plant would shed off soon. She hesitantly peeped out of the window and saw only one leaf on the creeper which might fall off the plant any time. However, Berman said no word and returned to his room. That night, the old artist decided to do something for Johnsy. He painted a similar leaf of an ivy plant and tied it on the creeper while Johnsy was asleep. But while doing so, he fell ill because of the exposure to freezing cold weather and heavy rainfall outside. After two days, he died of pneumonia. The next morning, Johnsy looked out of the window after a vicious storm the previous night and saw that the last leaf that was still clinging to the ivy plant was still there. This gave her the hope to live. She realized that she was foolish to pin her survival on the last leaf of a plant. She understood that there must be a definite reason why the last leaf remained in the creeper and it was sinful of her to want to die at such a young age. Soon, Johnsy recovered from her illness. Later, when Johnsy recovered from her illness completely, Sue told her that Berman had died of pneumonia. He had contracted the disease while being out in the cold and wet weather and he had painted the last leaf to give Johnsy the hope of survival. Finally, Berman had successfully painted his masterpiece, the leaf that saved Johnsy's life and gave her hope to live longer while he sacrificed his own life in the process. That brings us to the end of the summary. Today we are going over chapter 8 from Moments, which is a house is not a home. So what are we waiting for? Let's get right to it. Now, a house is not a home highlights the thin difference between a house and a home. It's based on the author Zan Gordioso's life. She mentioned the challenges that she faced being a teenager when she switched schools and grew up in a completely new environment. Now, the narrator discussed a real incident from her life that had a great impact on her as a teenager. She joined a new school and found it difficult to adjust to the new environment. She felt lonely and isolated in her surroundings. She missed her teachers and her friends from her old school and she visited them often. Her teachers told her to participate in extracurricular activities in the new school and to mingle with new people and make new friends. One Sunday afternoon, she was doing her high school homework while sitting at the dining table in her house. It was a cold day and her cat was lying on top of her and purring occasionally while her mother was stoking the fire in order to keep the house warm and cosy. Out of nowhere, she suddenly noticed smoke coming in through the ceiling. In no time, the entire room was filled with smoke and they rushed out of the house and saw that the roof of the house was engulfed in huge flames. The narrator was panic-stricken and looked dazed as she ran into her neighbourhood and called the fire brigade. Now, meanwhile, her mother rushed into the burning house to collect all the important documents and some pictures of her deceased father. The author was terrified when she saw her mother risk her life in order to get her things that were of value to her from inside the house. In the meantime, the fire brigade arrived and saved her mother. Suddenly, the author realized that her pet cat that was sitting on her lap a while ago was missing and she could not find her anywhere. She became upset and cried on not finding a cat and assumed that her pet might have died in the fire. The author's house was completely destroyed. It took the firefighters five hours to put out the fire completely. So Zan went to her grandparents' house with her mother. She went to school wearing the same clothes she wore the previous day and borrowed shoes and she felt embarrassed. 
she felt a huge loss and missed her old life and obviously her pet cat that day after school hours she visited her old house and was completely shocked to see the destruction caused by the fire she saw that whatever hadn't burnt was damaged by the water and chemicals that were used to put out the fire she had lost everything except the documents photo albums and some personal items that were saved by her mother most importantly she was heartbroken due to the loss of her pet cat soon the news of the fire spread to her new school and everyone was grief stricken at her loss they helped her by providing notebooks clothes school supplies and all of that now the author's heart was touched after seeing the concern of the people of her new school people who never spoke to her or approached her before had offered to help her meanwhile she also made new friends and was happy and relieved that she was no more alone in her new school a month later zan visited her old house and was watching it being rebuilt along with her new friends suddenly a woman approached her and brought her cat along with her the author was overjoyed seeing her pet cat and was filled with gratitude for the lady for taking the trouble to find the rightful owner of the cat she held the woman's arms and cried out of happiness the author was grateful for everything now her life her friends and the kindness of the lady who brought her cat to her she felt all the overwhelming feelings of loss and tragedy slowly go away and that brings us to the end of our summary now today we'll be going over the summary of the beggar by anton chekhov so let's get right to it so as i just told you the beggar is a short story written by anton chekhov who was a russian playwright and a short story writer one of the greatest writers of all time now this is a story of a poor alcoholic beggar named lushkov who used to lie and beg on the roads he used to beg in order to survive one day lushkov met a person named sergey and asked him for some money Lushkov was wearing a ragged, tan, tattered, torn overcoat and had dull, drunken eyes with a red spot on either cheek. He claimed that he had been a school teacher in a village earlier and he lost his job due to some conspiracy against him. So, in order to survive and keep himself alive, he had to start begging. Sergey remembered that he had met the same beggar a few days ago on another street and at that time he had said some different story about how he was a student who had been expelled now sergey was filled with disgust and threatened to hand over the beggar to the police for cheating people and telling lies Hearing this Lushkov broke down and admitted that he was lying to people so that they would take pity on him for his condition. He confessed that in reality he used to sing in a Russian choir and was fired from there because of his drinking habit. He said that nobody would offer him any work and hence the only thing that he could really do is beg for money. Now Sergey asked him if he would chop wood for him at his house. Lushkov agreed even though he did not really want to do that kind of work. Now Sergey hastened and called out his cook Olga and asked her to take this poor man into the wood shed and let him chop wood. Olga did so as she looked at Lushkov with contempt. Now Sergey could see all of this happening from the window of his room. Although Lushkov had become very weak due to his drunkenness, Sergey saw that he was actually trying to chop the wood. Sergey felt sorry and ashamed for making this sick man do menial labor on such a cold day. But an hour later, Olga informed Sergey that all the wood had been chopped. So Sergey ordered her to give Lushkov half a ruble for his work. Eventually Lushkov would come in 
once in a month to do work and he would receive a wage for all the work that he did. Soon, Sergei moved to a new house and he employed Lushkov again, who was now completely sober, for packing and hauling the furniture. Although Lushkov arrived there for the job, he really didn't do anything. He did not even pretend to move the furniture. But Sergei was under the assumption that Lushkov did his work and he offered him uh, an opportunity for a cleaner employment and asked if he would write. Lushkov replied that he could and Sergei gave a letter uh, to Lushkov to be sent to a friend. Lushkov took the letter but he never returned to Sergei's place. Two years passed after all of this happened and one evening Sergei saw Lushkov at the ticket counter of a theatre paying for his seat. And he was surprised to see that Lushkov was very well groomed and looked sophisticated. Sergei was astonished upon seeing this transformation and asked Lushkov about it. Lushkov replied saying that he was now working as a notary and was paid 35 rubles every month. Sergei was happy that he could help Lushkov become a responsible human being and he felt good for showing him the right path. Lushkov thanked Sergei for his kindness and helping him when he was a beggar, but then he said that he was actually more grateful to Olga, the cook, for her compassionate nature. He revealed that it was her and that she was the one who used to chop all that wood that Sergei thought Lushkov was chopping. And being a kind-hearted lady, she would give away the money to Lushkov even though she was the one who did all the hard work. She would also scold him but at the same time feel bad and weep at his poor condition. She had advised him to give up his alcoholism and drinking habit and was responsible for helping him to mend his ways. Also owing to her kind words, her noble deeds and the fact that she felt all these emotions towards him, Lushkov had a change of heart. He stopped drinking completely and started working hard to earn his livelihood. She set a right example before him and he said that he would always remain indebted to her for her kindness and compassion and that she was really the one who led to his transformation. That brings us to the end of the summary.